Eight years before Columbus reached the Americas, a Portuguese seaman first stepped onto the forbidding shores of Southwest Africa. And he paused just long enough to put up a stone cross. The cross was undisturbed and probably unseen for four centuries. Many ships were wrecked here. So many that to this day, it is called the Skeleton Coast. Laborers who today collect diamonds over the shoreline of the Namib Desert know it is the coast of hell. The dunes form and change, cover and reveal houses and streets and machinery. From the east, the land is guarded by the wastes of the Kalahari Desert. But inside this geographic straitjacket, there is water and land where people can live, raise cattle, grow food. The country is larger than France and Britain together. But so much of it is desert that the good land is precious most numerous of all the peoples of Namibia are the Ovambos, who are penned into their so-called homeland in the north of the territory. No Ovambo may leave here without a contract, generally for 12 or 18 months, which brings him south to work on white-owned mines or farms or factories. But in the making of these contracts, he has no... The Pretoria government says that all is peaceful in Avambo land and claims the people are content with the existing situation. Nonetheless, in December 1971, 13,000 Avambos went on strike. Strikes are forbidden, but they left their jobs and went home. The Herreros, another Namibian people, had long before learned the cost of saying no to their white masters. White men first saw the vast central plains of Namibia in the second half of the 18th century, when Western travelers first encountered the herds of the Herero and Nama peoples. Skilled cattle raisers, hunters, warriors, explorers in their own right. There was competition for the best grazing and water. The Nama and the Herero were then sworn enemies and remained so until the Germans arrived a century later to provide a common foe for all Namibians, including the Damaras and the Bushmen. It was then a time of despair for many of the tribes, and their songs still recount what happened. My hunting grounds have become even like unto a waterless land, since he who has settled here treats me in such an arrogant manner. And now, where may we live? We shall go forth and search. They all searched for new lands, but they found only labor contracts, economic inferiority, passes, and poverty. Of the total population of some 750,000, one in eight is white, usually of German or South African descent. Yet whites have twice as much land as Africans, and whites control the wealth. The land may be poor to look at, but it is rich to dig. Diamonds, copper, lead, zinc, uranium. Almost all the mining and prospecting ventures in the country are controlled by foreigners. A complex of South African, American, British, German, French, and Canadian companies puts the cheap labor to work, and the contract system pays a handsome profit. White-owned fishing fleets leave Walvis Bay at dawn each morning to fishing grounds that are among the richest in the world.
In the cattle country, white farmers own ranches as big as an English county. The Herreros, whose herds the early travelers used to admire, now work as laborers. Namibia today is an anachronism, a primitive colonial economy that persists in the age of decolonization. The Germans came to Southwest Africa in the 1880s and they brought the usual colonial pattern. First the missionaries, then the traders, finally the chartered companies and concessions. When the tribes objected and the companies lost money, Bismarck sent an imperial commissioner. His first job was to persuade the African chiefs to accept the so-called protection of Germany. The commissioner was named Goering, and his son would one day become notorious as the number two man in the Nazi Reich. The technique of persuasion was simple. When two tribes were hostile to each other, both would be offered military support. As the governor put it, the German policy was to influence the natives to kill each other for us. Chief Maharero of the Herreros signed such a protection treaty. His traditional enemy, Chief Bitboy of the Namas, wrote him a prophetic letter. This giving of yourself into the hands of the whites will become to you a burden as if you were carrying the sun on your back. In 1893, the Reichstag embarked on a policy of full colonization and encouragement of German settlement in the country. The man sent out to make Southwest Africa secure was Major Lutwein, later to become governor. He was a shrewd man. Contemporaries said he knew how to keep silent in seven different languages. There were skirmishes and uprisings, followed usually by an armistice or treaty. One by one, the chiefs, even Vitboy, were coaxed or bullied into protection agreements. And then out of Germany came settlers, traders, farmers, looking for new lands, a new wave of missionaries, and finally, fortune hunters. For there was wealth in the desert. There were diamonds to be found copper to be dug out. The settlers soon cast envious eyes on the tribal lands. The tribes had no concept of private land ownership, and they watched with dismay as their pastures were confiscated. Traditional water holes seized, herds diminished by deals that were often less than honest. By 1904, more than half their cattle had passed into German hands. Things had come to such a state that the Herero, with only 7,000 fighting men and only one-third of them with firearms, declared war against all the might of the German Empire. Chief Maharero gave orders to kill only German men, no women, no children, no missionaries. Reinforcements were summoned from Berlin the guns of Maxim and Krupp quickly shattered the insurrection. The whole Herero nation took flight. The chief fled across the desert to Botswana. By custom, as long as the chief is not captured or killed, the tribe remains unconquered. And because the chief survived, they never regarded themselves as a defeated people. an extermination order was issued. All Herero men, women, and children must be killed. But that proved to be too much even for the ancient enemies of the Herero, the Nama people. Their chief, Vidboy, was 80 years old, but he had had enough. He repudiated his treaty with the Germans 
and led his men to war. Lutwein conceded that Bitboy was a natural leader and ruler of men who might have been world famous had he not been born to a small African tribe. And he offered a reward for Bitboy's capture, dead or alive. By 1907, the chief was dead, killed in battle, and so were more than half his people. The Namas had been reduced from 20,000 to less than 10,000. Their leaders executed. A quarter of the survivors deported to other parts of the country. With the Herreros, it was worse. Before the extermination order, there had been 80,000 Herreros. Now, only 15,000 remained, forbidden to own cattle or land, allowed to stay on as wage laborers. Two-thirds of those left from this tribe of warriors went into exile. This is what the United Nations in a later age termed genocide. Governor Lutwein watched all this bloodshed with the utmost distaste. He wrote down this account of the destruction. Assets at the start, mining, farming, and native labor. Losses in the campaign, several hundred millions of German marks, several thousand German soldiers. Farming destroyed entirely. Two thirds of the native labor killed or exiled. That was seven years before the first great war, in which Britain asked the Herreros to join them against the Germans. What happened is told by Michael Scott, who later became world famous as a voice of conscience for the peoples of Namibia. They had been given to understand that at the end of World War I, their lands would be returned to them. Of course, what was meant was that there would be a treaty at the end of the war. When they asked for something to be written down about this, they were told that it, it would be written down after the war. Well, this came to be the Treaty of Versailles. And as you know, uh, the Treaty of Versailles safeguarded the rights of all the people in Germany's former colonies and possessions. And the purpose of that uh, Versailles Treaty was to establish a mandate system whereby these lands and peoples would not be treated as spoils of victory, as mere chattels in other people's wars, and would be regarded as sacred trusts of civilization. Ironically, it is a South African, the late General Smuts, who is often given the credit for inventing the League of Nations mandate system. Germany's former colonies passed to the League of Nations to be administered as a sacred trust for the indigenous peoples. The League conferred the mandate for Southwest Africa upon His Britannic Majesty to be exercised on his behalf by the Union of South Africa, then a British Dominion. For more than 20 years, the South African government submitted annual reports to the League of Nations. In 1946, the United Nations trusteeship system was set up to replace the mandate system. Togoland, Tanganyika, Cameroons, and six other territories spread over Africa and the Pacific passed into the UN's care. But not Namibia, where South African rule remained in force, though Pretoria claimed in 1947 and afterwards that the administration was going on in the spirit of the mandate. But with each passing year, it was made clear that Namibia was no more than a province of South Africa. The people had lived through two world wars, had seen Germany defeated twice, but their tribal lands were still in the possession of foreigners. There followed a quarter century of fruitless petitioning, of UN resolutions passed by overwhelming majorities, of special UN committees, of long drawn out cases at the International Court of Justice. In Southwest Africa from liberating their country. There will be no power in this world to divert the history of Africa. Namibia will be free. And while Namibians watched and waited, the other former mandates, later trust territories, became independent one by one. In 
In 1966, the General Assembly took a historic decision. By Resolution 2145, it brought the mandate to an end and declared yes. Namibia now to be under the direct responsibility of the United Nations. The resolution is adopted. South Africa rejected the resolution. A UN Council for Namibia was formed to take over the administration. It flew to Africa, but was not allowed to enter Namibia. Once again, the World Court took up the question. In 1971, the court declared the continued presence of South Africa in Namibia being illegal. South Africa is under obligation to withdraw its administration from Namibia immediately and thus put an end to its occupation of the territory. The South African Prime Minister replied, The government has no hesitation in rejecting the majority opinion. An advisory opinion, by its very nature, is of no binding force and in the present case is totally unconvincing. Five years earlier, a change had come about in the Namibian resistance movement. When we lodged an armed struggle in 1966, many party leaders were arrested, uh, thrown into military aircraft and uh, flown to Pretoria where there have been uh, illegal tried and descendants uh, of, of which 40 of them are serving life imprisonment and they are jailed at Robben Island and many others are serving uh, 20 to 5 years imprisonment. Uh, as a result, uh, our movement was forced to go underground and we are getting out to the struggle underground. We are in touch every day with the people. In 1972, the UN Security Council met in Addis Ababa and, and the case of Namibia was on its order of business. And surely, here is an opportunity for the Security Council meeting on African soil to bring preventive diplomacy to bear on a situation which before long can only lead to a violent conflict. Soon after that council session, Secretary General Kurt Waldheim flew to South Africa and tried to end the stalemate. I first met uh, the Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister after my arrival in South Africa. We had a number of uh, talks uh, during the first two days of my visit in uh, South Africa. Then I visited the country, I visited Namibia, I went up to the north and went down to different places in order to get uh, a better impression of the views of the populations in the country and uh, I hope that uh, we will be able uh, to make progress in, uh, uh, with regard to this question which is, I repeated, uh, independence and self-determination for Namibia. But it didn't work, and late in 1973, when the Security Council asked the Secretary General to terminate his contacts with Pretoria until some new thinking was apparent there. Early in 1974, the General Assembly appointed Sean McBride to be the UN Commissioner for Namibia. The former Irish cabinet minister spoke about his new responsibilities. Uh, the whole question of the effectiveness and credibility of the United Nations is involved because under the judgments of the International Court, under the resolutions of the General Assembly, Security Council, uh, Namibia should be a free territory under the control of Namib Namibian people. So for Namibia's peoples and her leaders, old and young, it has been a century of promises broken, of trust betrayed. Bye.